Good morning. Did we all benefit from the uh, extra hour of sleep? I don't think my children got the memo. <laughs> we have just a few announcements for you this morning before we begin the worship service. The first thing is next week on the 14th, we are holding a baptism service. That is going to be immediately following our worship service. So far, we have three people who are going to be baptized. So praise God for that. But if you have never been baptized, you can still sign up. Please come see me. Uh, there is still time uh, to get you on the schedule for next week. So that is next Sunday, the 14th, immediately following the baptism. So don't go running off as soon as I finish preaching next week. <clears throat> and actually, don't do it while I'm preaching either. <laughs> do it before. No. Um, on the 21st, uh, a couple things are happening. First of all, that's the last day to get your Operation Christmas Child shoebox back to us, uh, back to Ann Fountain. That is the 21st, so that is two weeks from today. If you're getting that together, you still have two full weeks. Also on the 21st, we are having our fellowship meal and budget vote and committee vote. So immediately following the service, we'll go straight into the fellowship meal. That is a potluck style meal, so please bring a covered dish with you, uh, something that you can pass around, and then right after that, we will be going straight into the vote. Now, we are proposing an amendment to the Constitution, so I'm going to share that with you right now, and I'll announce it next week as well, and then we'll vote on it on the 21st. So uh, the, the change would essentially uh, eliminate the meeting in January, and would solidify the meeting in November. So I'm going to go ahead and re read the proposed change to you so you have two weeks to think about it and pray about it. The annual meeting of the church, this is the proposed change, the annual meeting of the church shall occur on the Sunday immediately preceding Thanksgiving in November after the morning worship service. Officers shall be elected whose terms will begin on the first day of the next January. The proposed annual budget shall be approved to take effect on the first day of the next January. Transaction of other business shall occur as necessary. One third of the current membership plus one member shall constitute a quorum. All matters or questions shall be decided by a majority of qualified voters present. And there's a note to that. The Council of Elders, Boards, Committees, Servants, and other organizations shall prepare written annual reports for submission to the church office by the third Sunday in January. Annual reports shall be compiled and distributed on the fourth Sunday of January. So essentially what this would do is change us from a two-meeting format back to a one-meeting format, uh, where uh, in January, rather than holding another meeting, we would simply announce and then distribute the annual reports for the previous year. If you have any questions about that, uh, please come see me or uh, one of the elders. And like I said, we'll be voting on that on the 21st. So I'll announce it again next week. <clears throat> on Wednesday, December 15th at 6.30, I'm excited to announce that we will be hosting a Christmas fellowship night here at FBC. So that's, like I said, at 6.30 to about 8.30 p.m. There will be games, there will be crafts, there will be food. It's going to be something for the entire family. So we'll have more details as we go forward, but please go ahead and mark that down on your calendars. That is Wednesday, December 15th, and was also asked to announce that, uh, as is typical this time of year, we have poinsettias for sale. Uh, they are $10 each. They will benefit the classes of 2026, 2027, and 2028, and that officially makes me feel very old because I graduated high school in 2013. If any colors should run out, red will be substituted or money will be returned. If you would like to purchase a poinsettia for $10 to benefit these classes, please go ahead and see either Denise or Sarah, and the money is due by next Sunday. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, thank you guys very much. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to the worship team. The worship. Reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. 
Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him.
in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Savior spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free. salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee though the rugged cross my salvation
Father, I pray that you will please just come into this place today, Lord, as we bring this offering of worship, of song, and worship, of studying your word today. Father, please open our hearts, remove any distractions from our minds, Lord, cleanse us, make us pure in your sight, Lord, I just pray that you will help us to all grow through um, the word that Mark is going to bring, and just thank you indeed for the privilege that it is to meet here today and to come before you in worship, amen. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, please go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and today we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The Apostle John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the blessing of another day. Thank you for the blessing and the opportunity to gather here, not in our own names, but in your name. Lord, thank you for this spiritual family that you have brought together today. May our time in the Word this morning glorify and honor you. Lord, may it be a blessing to your people. Please use your Word and please use your Spirit to correct and to convict and to encourage and to enlighten us, Lord. We delight in studying your Word. We delight in praising and worshiping you. And it's for this reason that we are on this earth. We pray these things in the holy and precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen that there are a few definite realities in our lives. There is the reality, first of all, that Jesus is the Son of God. There's the reality that he took on flesh, that he walked on this earth. There's the reality that we were called into a great fellowship with God, and there's the reality that we were called into a fellowship with one another. These are all things that God has placed uh, in in his word that we might understand him, that by studying studying his word we might love him more, we might know him better, we might appreciate him, and we might praise him more. Now, we've seen too that one reality of our lives and one reality of the universe is sin and the effects of sin. This is the sin that takes place in our personal lives, right? Because we sin, as, as human beings, we sin in word and we sin in deed. Uh, we sin with our thoughts. We also have studied that we have a sin nature. But that God did not condemn us to just languish or to just wallow in sin our whole lives. But that God, through his love for us, because of his great love and because of the mercy that he's shown us, God has given us solutions for our sin, that we're not supposed to be stuck in sin, we're not supposed to be conquered by it, and ultimately we don't even have to pay the penalty for it. The first solution for sin that we looked at a few weeks ago was the confession of our sins and the forgiveness that follows from that. That was the first thing. That was uh, 1 John 1 verse 9. Last week we looked at another solution to sin, Jesus' advocacy on our behalf. Remember we studied how Jesus goes before the Father and intercedes for us. Jesus represents us to the Father when we sin, that we don't have to speak up in our defense, but that he does this for us. That's the second solution to sin. Now, the third solution to sin is Jesus' atoning sacrifice, and that's where we find ourselves this morning. Jesus' atoning sacrifice. And this is where we kick off here in 1 John 2, verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So I want us to spend some time exploring that and investigating that this morning that we can understand exactly what Jesus accomplished for us when he atoned for our sins, exactly what it means that he is the atoning sacrifice and how we have benefited from this so greatly. So for the first uh, main point of this sermon, I want us to take a look at the opening words of the first verse, of the opening words of 1 John 2 verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. John will go on to say, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, in the Greek, the word for atonement is pelasmos. 
Thalasmos. If I were to try to spell that for you, it would be H-I-L-A-S-M-O-S. That is the word for atonement in Greek. That's the word that John uses here in this verse. Now, halasmos in a literal sense means a satisfaction or an appeasement or to placate, right? If you placate someone who's angry, if someone comes up to you uh, and they're really angry about something, to placate them means you do something that kind of alleviates their temper. Uh, I went through this many times as a child, sometimes with my parents. I did something that made them angry, you know, I disobeyed them in some way, and rightfully they were angry with me, and I would try to do things to uh, placate or to appease their, their temper. Usually it just consisted of apologizing, and it's like, usually that was enough to clear it up. But there had to be something to remove the, the, the wrath from the situation, and this is what Halasmos gets at. Now, if you've read 1 John and other translations of Scripture, right now we're looking at it from the NIV, if you've read 1 John and other translations, you might see Halasmos translated as propitiation. That's kind of a big word. Or you might see it translated as atonement. Now, the, the translators of the NIV chose to use the phrase atoning sacrifice, uh, which I think works really well here. But halasmos, or, or to atone, means, like I said, it means to appease or to satisfy, basically to pay the penalty for. Now, from a worship perspective, because all of our lives are supposed to be about worship, from a worship perspective, I think that we need to understand that you and I can never exhaust and you and I can never run out of the manifold reasons that we're supposed to praise Jesus and we're supposed to thank Him, that we're supposed to be grateful to Him. And to study Scripture correctly is to come to a conclusion that Jesus is awesome. Now, I know the word awesome kind of gets thrown around a lot, but God is truly awesome. Jesus is truly awesome. Jesus is awe-inspiring in our lives. Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is majestic. Jesus is worthy of all of our praise. Now, the more that we study Scripture, as I said, the more that we should come to that conclusion. If we're studying Scripture properly, and if we're applying Scripture properly in our lives, then, then the response on our part should be, what an awesome God we serve. What an amazing God we serve. What a wonderful Savior who has saved us and redeemed us and blessed us. If we are studying Scripture and we're not coming to that conclusion, or if we're studying Scripture and we're coming to a different conclusion, then I think that we're not studying Scripture correctly. Because the, the appropriate conclusion of everything we find in God's Word is about glorifying Him and praising Him and realizing just how wonderful He is. So one huge reason that we should be praising Jesus is that, according to this passage, that He is our atoning sacrifice. That Jesus went before the Father, and Jesus, with His death and with His resurrection, He satisfied the wrath of God for us. Now, this is something that doesn't get discussed a lot in churches anymore. I've been in church uh, for over 20 years of my life. I think that this is something that doesn't get discussed enough that, that Jesus, one of the things that he did when he saved us, one of the things that he did when he saved you and when he saved me is that he went before the Father and he appeased the Father's wrath on our behalf. Because Scripture says that God is angered by sin. In, in the book of Psalms, it even goes so far as to say that God is angry with the wicked every day, right? That the sin of creation, that our sin, the sin of the world, has confronted God's holiness, the sin of the world has offended God's holiness, and because God's nature is one of uncompromising righteousness, His Word tells us that what He cannot do is He cannot overlook sin. He can't wink at sin. He can't let sin go unaddressed. His nature means that He cannot let sin go unpunished. Anytime there is a sin, there needs to be a punishment for it. Now, this is, like I said, this is an outworking of his character. It means this is a, an implication of his holiness. This is an implication of his righteousness. This is an implication of his perfection. He can't tolerate sin. His wrath demands that, uh, that it be appeased in some manner. His, ma his wrath upon sin demands that it be appeased in some way. Now, naturally, if it wasn't for Jesus, his wrath would rest upon, or his wrath would be visited upon, everyone who's violated his righteousness. Now, what's the main way that we violate God's righteousness? By breaking his law, by transgressing his law, right? By, by doing things that go against his character. Punishment for sin is the natural penalty for breaking his law. There's a sin, it's got to be punished. We know this in our own legal system. Someone breaks the law, there's got to be a punishment. Now, the punishment 
uh, changes in severity to the law that's broken, you obviously would get a different punishment for uh, keying someone's car than you would for murdering that person. But if there's a law that's broken, there has to be a punishment. If there's a law that's broken, there's got to be a punishment. So punishment is the penalty for breaking God's law. On the other hand, pardon is forgiveness that flows from God's grace. You have God's perfect character and his perfect righteousness demanding punishment, and you have his perfect mercy and you have his perfect grace allowing for forgiveness. Grace and justice have to go together. Punishment and pardon have to go together. Guilt and forgiveness have to go together. God's character doesn't allow him to compromise on either of those. God's character demands, like I said, a punishment for a sin. But his endless mercy and his endless riches demand that he shows forgiveness for sin as well. These things always have to go together. You can't have one without the other. If we emphasize God's justice, but we exclude his forgiveness, we haven't described God accurately. If we, exclude, if we emphasize his forgiveness, but we exclude his justice and his wrath, again, we haven't described him accurately. These two things always have to come together. And the way that they come together wondrously for us is that they come together in the sacrifice that pleases and satisfies him. This is the nature of the atonement. This is the nature of what Jesus offered. Whenever we talk about the gospel, one thing we have to remember is the wonder of the gospel is that it allowed us as sinful beings to be forgiven while not asking God to compromise on who he is. That through the gospel, we are saved and we're redeemed and we're forgiven and God's perfect, perfect moral righteousness, God's perfect character is not compromised. He could save us without having to tolerate sin. He could save us without having to overlook sin. This is the wonder of the gospel. This is something that only God could work. This is not something that we can work on ourselves. And this is what Jesus accomplished for us. He offered us forgiveness. He offered us the riches of God's mercy. And he offered his Father the satisfaction and the appeasement of his wrath. So this is what we mean when we say that Scripture, that the Scripture teaches that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice that satisfied the grace of God. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice, that he took God's wrath and we get the forgiveness that flows from that. We get a picture of this in the Old Testament because atonement is not something that just pops up in the New Testament. We get a picture of it in the Old Testament too. We actually get a very strong picture of it. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. I want us to focus on that last statement there. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. It is through the shedding of blood that forgiveness of sins comes around. It is through the shedding of blood that God's wrath is satisfied because it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. In Hebrews 9.22, we see this again. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And listen to this. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. If you read that in other translations, you might have heard, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, Jesus' sacrifice, the reason that we can call it all-sufficient, and that's the title of my sermon this morning, is the all-sufficient sacrifice. The reason that Jesus' sacrifice could be called all-sufficient is because he satisfied God's wrath in ways that the sacrificial system could never have accomplished, right? We know that the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament weren't sufficient. How do we know? because they had to offer them again and again and again and again. There was no sacrifice in the Old Testament that would completely satisfy God's wrath permanently. The satisfaction had to be offered again and again and again, right? <clears throat> Every year, they had to have the Day of Atonement. And constantly, priests are going into the temple to offer sacrifices. They're constantly trying to uh, atone for the sins of the people of Israel. They're constantly asking God's wrath uh, to be spared. They're constantly trying to allow for forgiveness for the sins of the people of Israel, but they had to do it over and over and over again, like being a priest was a full-time job. You were basically living in a temple. Anytime there was sin, there needed to be a sacrifice. But once Jesus laid down his life, Scripture says that once Jesus died, once Jesus laid down his life, and once Jesus made the payment, the sacrifices stopped. Why did no other sacrifices need to be made after, after Jesus' death? Why did I not come in here with a lamb under my arm this morning? Why am I not up here saying, uh, Lord, please forgive the sins of myself and please forgive the sins of this church and I'm going to slaughter this lamb? Why, do we need to, why don't we need to do sacrifices anymore? Because Jesus' sacrifice is the one that's satisfied. 
Jesus' sacrifice is the one that satisfies on an eternal scale, not just on a temporal scale. Anything else was just temporary. They had to keep making sacrifices over and over and over again. Right? Whenever you go to the Lord without a sacrifice of your own, whenever you go to the Lord without, uh, you know, killing a, a goat or killing a lamb or killing a bull, whenever you go before the Lord and you just ask him for forgiveness, what you're saying is, Jesus already paid my penalty. I don't need to keep doing this, you know. I don't need to keep making sacrifices. Now, when you make a sacrifice, it's a sacrifice of worship, like Kara said in her prayer. It's a sacrifice of praise. The sacrifices that we make now are just our way of serving God. They don't do anything to forgive our sins. They're just our way of saying, thank you for saving us, basically. So Jesus accomplished this for us. Now take a look with me at Isaiah 53, uh, verses 4 and 5. Surely, Scripture says, he took our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace was on him because... The satisfaction of God's wrath didn't ultimately come to us, it came to Jesus who did it on our behalf. Now another thing I think this passage teaches, so the main thing we need to understand is that Jesus' sacrifice alone is what satisfies the wrath of God. Another thing this passage teaches us clearly is that Jesus' sacrifice is the basis for his advocacy. Jesus' sacrifice is the basis for his advocacy. Last week we looked at Jesus advocating for us uh, before the Father, interceding for us or representing for us. He does this because of his sacrifice. So let's take a look at 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, right? We looked at when, whenever you're standing before God, you don't want to do it on your own authority. You don't want to be the one who does the talking, but you want Jesus doing the talking for you. It's inevitable that we sin, right? We never stop sinning, but when we do sin, we don't go before the Father ourselves. Jesus goes before the Father for us. And the basis of Jesus' advocacy, I think Scripture teaches, the basis of his advocacy for us comes from his sacrifice on the cross. I think that Jesus' sacrifice is the power behind his advocacy. I don't think those two things can be separated. That we as Christians, we need Jesus as both our advocate and we need him as our atoning sacrifice. We can't separate those two things. We can't have it any other way if we're going to be in Christ. We, he is our advocate and he's our sacrifice. Either God's wrath is satisfied in Jesus and Jesus is our advocate or he's not. I think it's a package deal. Now this is kind of the nature of the gospel. We have to embrace and we have to receive the whole gospel if we're going to be saved. We can't just pick and choose the parts of the gospel that we like and leave out the parts that we don't, right? There's no middle ground when it comes to the gospel. Either you believe that God's wrath is satisfied in Jesus or you don't. Either you believe that your sins are forgiven or you don't. Either you believe you're reconciled to God through Jesus or you don't. We can't, like, there's no, there's no middle ground here. Either we get the whole gospel or we get none of it. The gospel is basically not a, a menu at a fast food restaurant, right? You can't just go up to, the, up to the cash register and say, well, I want something from this column, and I want something from this column, but I don't need any of this. That's not the way the gospel works, right? Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The claim that the gospel makes on all of us is one that's extremely exclusive. You come to God, basically what the gospel is saying is you come to God on his terms, or you don't come to God at all. You come to God the way he says to, or you don't come to him at all. You get reconciled the way that he says to get reconciled, or you don't get reconciled. This is because he is God, and we're not. He's sovereign, and we're not. He's the king of the universe, and we're the creation. We play by his rules, or we don't play the game at all, right? You either get Jesus as the advocate, and you get him as the atonement, or you don't get him at all. This is the way that God has designed it, because he had to design the gospel in exactly the way he did, as I said earlier, to avoid compromising either his righteousness or his perfect mercy and forgiveness. And we get to reap the benefits of it. But we don't get to decide it for ourselves. God is the one who sets the terms. About 20 years ago, Keith Getty and Stuart Townend released a hymn. It was called In Christ Alone. Are you guys familiar with this? 
right? It's all about Jesus conquering death. It's about his resurrection. It communicates the gospel message really clearly. But there's a line in the second verse that caused a good bit of controversy. Uh, in the second verse, he says, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Yeah. So, right, we know from Scripture that that's accurate. But a lot of churches, when this hymn was becoming popular and it was making the rounds, a lot of churches decided that they weren't going to play it uh, because they found the idea of God's wrath to be too offensive. Or they said, you know, the cross was not a means of God's wrath being satisfied. They didn't want people thinking about God's wrath. They didn't want people thinking about punishment. They only wanted people to think of God as just all love, all mercy, you know, no justice, no wrath. He doesn't demand repentance. His anger doesn't need to be satisfied. So a lot of them just said, we're not going to play this song. Uh, this is not going to be a worship song for us. Or if we do play it, we're going to change the lyrics so that we exclude this line about God's wrath, right? God is, God is just never going to punish anyone. We don't need to sing songs about this. Let me tell you something. If we don't understand God's wrath, and if we don't see how God's wrath is part of the gospel, then we don't understand the gospel. If we don't see how Jesus satisfied God's wrath, if we don't see how Jesus took the punishment for us, if we don't see how Jesus appeased or placated God's wrath, then we don't understand really what Jesus did. If we don't understand the gospel, we can't proclaim it. And if we willingly alter the gospel, or if we pervert the gospel in some way, or if we change the gospel message, then we really don't have any right to call ourselves believers. Scripture says, woe unto me if I don't proclaim the gospel. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Right? We can't just pick the parts we like and avoid the parts that we don't find comforting because the fact is, God is wrathful. His wrath was satisfied in Jesus. And a God who is all love and a God who is all mercy and a God who is no wrath, a God who is no justice, is not the God of the Bible. That's an idol. That's not the God of the Bible. Again, we have to come to God on his terms or we don't come to God at all. We have to come to God asking his wrath to be satisfied in Jesus for us or we don't come to God at all. But you can't come to God on his terms if you don't even know who you're talking to. If you've invented a God who's not the God of Scripture, how are you going to approach him on his terms? If we're trying to ignore a major characteristic of God, that he is wrathful, then how could we possibly worship him and how could we ask him to save us? How can you ask to be saved from God's wrath if you don't think God has any wrath, right? We have to know about God's wrath if we're going to fully appreciate what Jesus delivered us from. Another, another negative point of minimizing God's wrath is that if you minimize God's wrath, you naturally minimize Jesus' sacrifice. If you minimize the wrathfulness of God, you naturally minimize what Jesus did on your behalf, right? We're told to glorify Jesus. We're told to thank him. Downplaying God's wrath is kind of the opposite of that. Downplaying God's wrath is the opposite of exalting him because it's saying, you didn't need to go to the cross for that. God's not wrathful. You didn't need to pay that sacrifice. You didn't need to pay that penalty. 1 Peter 3 verse 18 talks about this. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but he was made alive in the spirit. He was put to death in the body, but he was made alive in the spirit. So we have to understand that Jesus' sacrifice is the basis for his advocacy. Another thing that I think Scripture teaches us about this is that Jesus did not just provide the atoning sacrifice. Jesus himself is the atoning sacrifice. Jesus did not just provide the atoning sacrifice. He is the atoning sacrifice. Now, one of the main reasons that we can say Jesus is superior to the Old Testament system is because he didn't just have to supply an atoning sacrifice, right? But John today goes so far as to say he himself is our atoning sacrifice. That when Jesus makes a sacrifice to satisfy God's wrath, when Jesus went to the cross to satisfy God's wrath, he didn't have to look outside of himself for that sacrifice. He didn't have to bring anything external with him to make the sacrifice. Just the fact that he was present and just the fact that he was laying down his own life made the atonement possible, right? Like I said earlier, I don't come to church with a lamb under my arm. But the reason that I don't have to come to church with a lamb under my arm is because Jesus didn't have to go to Calvary with a lamb under his arm. Jesus didn't have to bring with him a bull. Jesus didn't have to bring with him a goat to Calvary. He didn't have to bring anything other than himself to make the sacrifice. And in making that sacrifice, in showing himself to be the all-sufficient sacrifice, we don't have to make any sacrifices either, right? <clears throat> He supplied everything that was needed. 
Now, we've talked about recently, Jesus is our great high priest, right? There have been lots of priests in the Bible. Lots of them were important. Jesus is our great high priest. And this is one way that he is definitely and clearly superior to the priests of the Old Covenant. They needed to bring something to make the sacrifice to God. He is the sacrifice in and of himself. And because of his sacrifice alone, we are pardoned and we're forgiven. This comes up in Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, verses 5 and 7, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased, right? He wasn't ultimately pleased with sin offerings and burnt offerings. God wasn't. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. And by that will, verse 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, right? By the will of God and by the sacrifice of his own body, Hebrews 10 says, you and I have been made holy. The sacrifices and offerings of the Old Testament had no power to really satisfy God's wrath. This passage says he wasn't pleased by burnt offerings. The only thing that those sacrifices accomplished were that they paved the way for Jesus. They basically pointed people to Jesus. There's a system of sacrifices where you have to keep making sacrifices and you have to keep going back into the temple. This helps you look forward to the time when a Messiah comes and he is the sacrifice and this whole system stops. All they did was point people to Jesus. When Jesus fulfilled that system, he abolished it, essentially. (coughs) But that was their only purpose. And it's through Jesus' sacrifice that we're saved. Here again, this is solidified in Romans 3, verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice for atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. (coughs) God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Now, the second major thing that this passage teaches us, in my opinion, is that Jesus' sacrifice covered the sins of the entire world. Jesus' sacrifice covered the sins of the entire world. So, we'll talk about that for a little bit. Take a look where I think we find this in the second half of our verse this morning. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, the reason that I think we can call Jesus' sacrifice all-sufficient is because Scripture teaches us that his sacrifice covered everybody's sins. Now, when I say that, I, what I mean to tell you is that Jesus' death and resurrection paid for or satisfied God's wrath for every sin that was committed by every person who ever lived. Every sin that was committed by every person, (coughs) Jesus' sacrifice satisfied God's wrath for that. (coughs) Excuse me. And his sacrifice satisfied equally for everyone. That is, my sins were atoned for just as much as your sins were atoned for. Your sins were atoned for just as much as your grandparents' sins were atoned for. You know, our sins collectively were atoned for (coughs) just as much as the sins of people on the other side of the world who we've never met. That when when Jesus made the payment for sins, it was with the intention of covering the entire world with his sacrifice. That... You know, there's, there's no person and, and there's no one who ever lived and there's no sin that was ever committed where Jesus' wrath did not satisfy, where Jesus' sacrifice did not satisfy God's wrath. Now, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested and before he's put under trial. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying to his father. And he's so distressed that scripture says he began sweating, as it were, drops of blood. That he's under so much turmoil, he's under so much emotional and physical stress and he, he, be, he begins sweating blood. Now, this is an actual medical condition that happens when people reach a, a certain boiling point of stress. They can actually sweat blood. Um, now, he goes before his father and he says, right, he's praying. He says, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. Right? If, if, if there's any way that it's your will for me not to have to make this sacrifice, please let this cup pass from me. But then he goes on and he says, 
yet not my will be done, but your will be done. Like he's saying, ultimately, if it is your will for me to pay this, this price, then I will go ahead and do it. And why is he so distressed? Like, what does he mean when he says, let this cup pass from me? The cup that he's referring to here and the cup that he's about to drink from is the wrath of God for all of us. Now, Jesus knows he has perfect knowledge. He knows that he is about to receive the wrath of his Father. He's about to receive the wrath of God on behalf of the entire world, right? That God is going to pour out his wrath on Jesus, that God is going to pour out his anger on Jesus without holding back, yeah? Now, Scripture teaches that when, when he's on the cross and when he's undergoing this punishment, Jesus is receiving the punishment that you and I basically should have had to receive. He's taking the punishment in our place. He's receiving the treatment that you and I should have received. The result of this is that we get the righteousness and we get the blessings that only he should have received. Because Jesus isn't the one who broke the law. Jesus isn't the one who sinned. We're the ones who sinned. Why should Jesus have to pay the penalty when he lived a perfectly sinless life? But scripture says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus drank in full measure, Scripture tells us, Jesus drank in full measure the cup of God's wrath so that you and I could drink in full measure the cup of his mercy. That the, the, the exact treatment that should have been for us, he absorbed all of that. And the treatment that he should have gotten, we absorbed all of that. And he did this for the entire world. Now, Scripture says, basically, there's no way that we could pay Jesus back for this. There's nothing we could possibly do to make ourselves worthy. It's just a gift. We just have to accept it. There's no way we can adequately say thanks, but this is why I say earlier, when we study Scripture, it should lead us to the conclusion that He is to be thanked, He is to be praised, He is to be worshipped, because we can at least express our gratitude, and we can at least express our appreciation, even if we could never do anything to earn His sacrifice, and even if we could never do anything to pay it back. But this is why Scripture harps on sin so much. This is why sin is held up as such a big thing. It's because of our sin that Jesus had to go to the cross. It's because of our iniquity and it's because of our transgressions that he had to make this sacrifice. This is why scripture is so clear. Sin is nothing to play around with. Sin is the reason that our Savior had to lay down his life. Sin is the reason that he had to undergo an illegal trial, that he had to be beaten, that he had to be whipped, that he had to be forced to carry his own cross. Sin is the reason that he had to die on Calvary. When we mess around with sin or when we don't see sin the way that it is, when we play around with sin... We are not showing the, the proper appreciation for Jesus' sacrifice. That there should be something in our hearts that says, I know that it's because of my own rebellion that you had to undergo all of this. When we eliminate that, we don't see the true sacrifice that Jesus had to make. That it's because of our sin that he had to have the Father's wrath poured out on him. We can't mess around with sin. We can't play around with sin. Sin should always loom large in our minds as this is the reason that my Savior and this is the reason that my Lord had to die. Because that's what sin is. Now when John is describing the group for whom Jesus died, he says in verse 2, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Greek word for world, the word in the New Testament for world is cosmos. People still use this word today. You'll hear, oh, the cosmos. Like they're talking about the universe. Okay. The mysteries of the cosmos. Like, wasn't there like a sci-fi show? Like, you are stardust. It's all in the cosmos. Anyway. But the, the, I don't care about that. The Greek word for cosmos and the, what John is using it to refer to is basically the entirety of mankind, right? All of mankind, <clears throat> all of humankind. This is the word that he's, this is what he's trying to capture when he uses the word cosmos. Cosmos uh, encompasses all of people's lives. It encompasses all of their deeds, all of their actions. It's the sum of everything that every person will do. That's the cosmos we talk about. If John didn't want to communicate that Jesus died for every single person, if he wanted to make a different argument, he definitely would not have used the word cosmos. Because his, his audience would have understood what John is saying. There's, he said, they, I guarantee you the original audience read this and they said, okay, Jesus didn't just die for my sins. He didn't just die for the sins of this group but he died for the sins of all of humanity, right? Now take a look at other passages in the New Testament where we find the same word used. <clears throat> Jesus himself says in John 6, verse 51, 
I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Or you may have heard, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Which I will give for the life of the world, right? The, Jesus is the living bread. Jesus is the bread of life that's offered for all mankind. Jesus says, basically, one bite of this bread, you will never hunger again, you'll never thirst again, but it's offered to the entire world. In John 1, verse 29, John the Baptist, who is a different John than who wrote 1 John, but ironically, that John also wrote the Gospel of John. If you're ever looking for a good biblical name for your children, you really can't go wrong with John. He says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When you share the gospel with people, and when I share the gospel with people, Scripture says that we should share the gospel message of salvation freely, like without any reservation. That you should feel comfortable, completely unaware of who someone is, right? If you don't know somebody at all, if you just met someone on the street, you should feel completely comfortable looking them in the face and saying, Jesus died for your sins. That scripture so clearly teaches he died for the sins of the world, that he willingly laid down his life so that everyone in the world could have eternal life, that this should shape the way that we share the gospel, that this should give us a confidence in sharing the gospel that nothing else could give us, that every single person that you meet, and every single person that I meet, everyone we cross paths with, no matter who they are, no matter where they're from, <clears throat> no matter what they look like, Every single person we cross paths with is somebody who Jesus died for. Every single person you ever lock eyes with is somebody who Jesus died for. And every person you cross paths with is someone who was created in the image and likeness of God and was therefore created to have a special fellowship with him. Now, why is this fellowship and why is this relationship damaged? It's damaged because of sin. It's damaged because of the effects of sin. But to remedy that, Jesus gave his life for the entire world. So this should give us an incredible boldness in sharing the gospel because he already paid the penalty for that person's sin. He already satisfied God's wrath for that person. Why would we not share it with them, right? Now, another thing that I think this passage teaches us is that the atonement really is unlimited. The atonement is unlimited. There are any number of ways that people will try to describe the atonement, which is the payment that Jesus made to satisfy God's wrath. There are any number of ways that people will try to describe this. I think the best way to describe the atonement, based on what Scripture says, is to say that the atonement is unlimited. And I think that it has to be this way because Jesus himself is unlimited, right? Jesus himself is eternal. He's not bound by time. He's not bound by space. Jesus himself is, uh, is all-encompassing. So his sacrifice would have to be that way too. Just like we can't limit Jesus, right? You can't... You can't limit Jesus in any way. Anytime you try to put Jesus in a box, Scripture will, will not let you do that. You can't limit him in any way. And just like you can't limit him, you can't limit his love for people. You can't limit his love for the world. You couldn't possibly quantify Jesus' love for the world if you were to understand just how much Jesus loves you. If you were to understand just how much Jesus loves your neighbors and your family members. You can't possibly put a number on it. You can't possibly even describe it. And because his atonement for us is based on his love for us, you can't quantify that either. Really, the only thing you could say about the atonement is that it's unlimited. Just, it applies for every person's sin that ever walked the earth, whoever will walk the earth, right? <clears throat> it's not just limited to people who, who were living in Palestine in the first century. It's not just limited to people who are living in the United States right now. It's not just limited to people uh, who, who spoke Greek or who spoke Hebrew. It's not limited in any way. It's completely unlimited. It reaches all of us. And Jesus died so that everyone could be saved, right? Now, this should remove from us any sense of pride. This, if there's any pride that we're feeling about anything in our lives, this should remove from us any sense of pride because God's love is the great equalizer. God doesn't love any of us more than he loves the rest of the world. He didn't, Jesus didn't die especially for me because I'm a pastor. He didn't die for the elders here just because they, you know, he didn't give his life any more for them because he knew they would become elders, right? He didn't die for any of us more because he knew we'd be members of this church. His love and his sacrifice is the great equalizer, that he died for everyone equally so that everyone can reap equally the benefits of salvation. 
So there should be no sense of pride. We all need Jesus' death just as much as the next person does. And he offered it for us just as much as he offered it for the next person. So there should be no reason for us to feel uh, prideful. There should be no reason to treat anyone with, uh, with less than the dignity that they're, that they're entitled to. There should be no reason to hold back the gospel message of salvation because Jesus' love is what changes things. Jesus himself said in John chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. In this passage, Jesus is talking about his death before it takes place. He's prophesying about his death, right? Because when he was crucified on Calvary, he was literally lifted from the earth. He was lifted from the earth on a cross. And Jesus is saying, when that happens, when I die, you know, when I lay down my life and I make that payment for the satisfaction of God's wrath, I am going to draw all people to me. That there's not a person for whom this sacrifice is insufficient. This is going to be the all-sufficient sacrifice. I will draw all people to me. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, Paul says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. 2 Peter 2, verse 1 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them and bringing swift destruction on themselves. Even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. So even false teachers were purchased with Jesus' sacrifice. Even the people who are so wicked and even the people who are so evil that they're denying Jesus' sacrifice, Scripture says those are the very people for whom Jesus also died. Right? He even died for people who, who bring in heresies into the church. He even died for people who sneak false doctrine into the church. In Luke 19.10, Jesus himself says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I want to bring your attention to this verse specifically because this is really telling. This is Jesus talking about himself. This is Jesus talking about his mission. When we read Luke 19.10, what we're, what we're getting is we're getting a window into Jesus' heart, and we're getting a window into Jesus' desires for us. Why did I come to earth, Jesus is basically saying, to seek and to save the lost? That was his purpose. That's the reason that he took on flesh and walked among us. Jesus didn't just want to seek the lost and then leave them lost. He didn't want to just seek the lost and then abandon them, but he wanted to seek the lost and rescue them. Right? He wanted to seek the lost and he wanted to bring them into the kingdom. This passage says he wanted to seek the lost and he wanted to give them eternal life. He came to seek and save the lost. Now we know from this passage that he died for everyone because the lost is everyone. Everyone is lost apart from Christ. Everyone is lost before they were saved. The lost are the largest group in humanity because it's all of humanity. This term applies to all of us. This excludes nobody. All of us, before we were saved, were lost. So if he were to say that he was limiting his sacrifice in some way, or if he were to say he didn't die for everyone, he wouldn't say, I came to seek and save the lost. He would say, I came to seek and save some of the lost. Or I came to seek and save a few of the lost. But to say the lost, that's all of us. There's not a single person who doesn't fit into that. A lot of people will be describing their testimony and they'll say, well, I was lost and then I found God. Well, I mean, not really. God found you. God found me. God found us. Because God wasn't the one who was lost. We were. Right? God didn't need to be reconciled to us. We needed to be reconciled to him. We were the ones who violated the reconciliation. But he loves us so much that he makes these provisions so that everybody can be saved. And this was the purpose that Jesus came to earth. When you're disagreeing with a Christian about something, when you're disagreeing with a Christian about anything that's not related to the gospel, if you disagree about the way that a church should be run, or you disagree uh, about a, a worship style, or you disagree about the kind of Bible that people should carry, what is one thing that can always bring you back to unity? Jesus' sacrifice. That I was lost, you were lost, we were lost, Jesus found us. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. That if we agree on that, it doesn't matter what kind of Bible translation we prefer. It doesn't matter what color we think the carpet should be. It doesn't matter 
you know, if we live in urban settings, rural settings, a small town, if we can agree that Jesus came to seek and save the lost and that we need his sacrifice, we can make a relationship work almost all of the time, I think. But a lot of times we tend to elevate things over and above that, and that destroys fellowship and that destroys partnership. But we should always be bringing it back, right? Keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is Jesus' love for the world. The main thing is his death and resurrection. That's the gospel message of salvation. We always need to be bringing it back to that because that is our mission here on earth. Now, finally, I think that this passage teaches us that because Jesus died for the sins of the world and because he satisfied uh, God's wrath for the whole world, we are responsible for accepting Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. We are responsible for accepting Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. And I've talked about responsibility uh, a little bit in the past few weeks, but I think it especially applies here. Now, the natural question is, and I think where this comes into play, is a lot of people will object to the belief that God, died, that, that God sent his son to die for everyone. A lot of people would, will object to this and say, well, if the atonement is unlimited, and if Jesus faced God's wrath for every sin and for every sinner, they'll ask, then why do people still go to hell? Right? Why is God still punishing them? If God's wrath was satisfied in Jesus, why do people go to hell? A very wealthy donor one time approached the president of a college, a private college that had about 2,000 students. And this donor had been blessed with lots and lots of wealth, and so he wanted to, in turn, bless the, this college. And so he, he went up to the president, he made an appointment at the college, and he sat down with the president and he said, I want to make a donation to your college that is so large that every student here can receive a full scholarship and can have all their expenses covered. They won't have to worry about student loans. They won't have to worry about other scholarships. I want to make one donation so big that it covers every single expense that a student could face. Now, obviously, when the president heard this, he was delighted, right? This isn't a difficult thing to market. It reflects really well on the school. And... Uh, it would be very well received by the student body. So the donor continued. He goes, there's just one condition. In order for a student to receive this scholarship and in order for the scholarship to be applied to their account, they have to come to your office personally and ask you to apply the funds to their account. That's the only condition. If they do that, they'll get 100% of the scholarship that they need, but they have to ask you for it. They have to come to your office in person and ask you for it. If they don't do it, they don't receive the scholarship. So the president announces this scholarship to the school. He goes, it's all this money, come get some, have your tuition paid, never worry about another expense for the rest of your time here. He announces this to the 2,000 students. He makes the condition for receiving the scholarship clear. Now that the money is in, you have to come to my office and you have to ask me to apply it to your account. He makes this very clear. A year later, the board of directors conducts an audit and they find that out of the 2,000 students, at the college, only 1,000 of them have received the scholarship. They're like, why, why, is this, why doesn't every single student have the scholarship? Why have only half of them received the scholarship? So they go to the president, they pull him aside, they go, what's going on here? And the president shares honestly with them. He goes, out of these 2,000 students, half of them never, never satisfied the condition for receiving the funds. They never came to my office. They never asked me to apply the funds to their account. He goes, I can't give the scholarship if that condition isn't satisfied. The ones who did satisfy the condition, they got the scholarship. And the ones who didn't get it, they only didn't get it because they didn't ask for it. You see, God, in his wisdom and in his sovereignty, has decided that every single person who asks him for salvation will receive it. Everyone who asks him, he makes this offer freely to the entire world. Everyone who comes to him by faith and asks to be saved will be saved. Scripture says he will not turn away a single person, everyone who asks for Jesus' atoning sacrifice to be applied to their account will receive the benefits of it. He's opened the door to salvation for everyone. And all that he asks for a person to be saved is that they have faith in him and they trust him for salvation. He does not discriminate against anyone. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, but this is what's required of us to benefit from Jesus' sacrifice. Whoever comes, he'll never cast them aside. But those who do not come will not have Jesus' sacrifice applied to their account. God is not going to force anyone to have their sins forgiven. God is not going to force anyone to be reconciled to him. But he makes 
everyone free to receive it, and he makes the gift free to everyone. He does not discriminate, and this is what Jesus paid the price for. It's really as simply as asking God, please apply Jesus' sacrifice to my life and to my soul so that I don't have to receive your wrath for my sins. And the only reason that many people are not saved is because they will not do that. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and you stone those who were sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? And listen to this. This is one of the saddest statements in all of Scripture. And you were not willing. I would have gathered you. I would have made you my children. I would have forgiven your sins. I would have given you eternal life. I would have brought you into the kingdom. All you had to do was come to me. All you had to do was ask. The reason people are not saved is because they will not ask God for salvation. And let me tell you something, because we have this freedom, we will have no excuses on Judgment Day. No one is going to be able to accuse God, but you didn't make provision for me to be saved. You didn't allow me to be saved. You didn't choose me. You didn't send your son to die for me. And he's going to say, you were not willing. I made provision. You could have been saved. You could have had your sins forgiven. You chose not to ask for salvation. The reason that you and I are saved and the reason that we need to share this message of salvation with others is because of God's grace, because of God's mercy, because of his love. Now, if you have personally never asked God to save you, if you have personally never approached God in faith, I want to encourage you to do that right now, right? You can talk to me. If you have any questions, you can talk to the elders. But I can assure you tomorrow is not guaranteed for any of us. So don't put this off any longer, right? Put your faith in Jesus today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you so much for his sacrifice on our behalf that satisfied and appeased your wrath that we don't have to pay the penalty for our sins. Lord, for as long as we're saved, help us to never lose sight of this. Help us to never put anything above it. Help us to never be ungrateful. Help us to never take it for granted. Help us to walk closely with you. We love you so much. Lord, please continue to guide and correct and convict us. Please walk closely with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
It is our desire to please you in our thoughts and in our actions. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Lord, we praise you so much for the wondrous nature of the gospel, that you could forgive us of our sins and not compromise your perfect righteousness. Help us to proclaim this gospel to a lost and dying world. We love you so much. pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us today as we close our service with another song of worship. I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ 
and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.